Good afternoon. This hearing is now called to order. This is a public hearing of the City Council's Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear testimony on resolution number 170971 and bill number 170956. I recognize the presence of uh, quorum uh, with Councilwoman Blonda Reynolds Brown, Councilman Green, Councilwoman Parker, Councilman Johnson, and Councilman Tollenberger, along with myself as chair. Um, would the clerk please read the title of the bill and resolution? Bill number 170956, an ordinance amending Chapter 17, 1300 of the Philadelphia Code, entitled Philadelphia 21st Century Minimum Wage and Benefit Standard, by revising provisions regarding waivers of minimum wage requirements, all under certain terms and conditions, and resolution number 170971, a resolution authorizing the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development to hold hearings regarding initiatives to support employee ownership, including as a retirement strategy for small business Williams. owners. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your patience. We had a, a full docket today. Uh, interesting testimony, and I don't see why that's not going to continue this afternoon. I'd like to recognize Councilman Green, who is the author of the resolution we're going to hear today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank the panels for being here this afternoon, my colleagues being here for this testimony, and it deals with the issue of employee stock ownership programs, ESOPs, and coming from a, a banking background and at one point being a securities lawyer, I had one perspective of ESOPs, but having an opportunity to talk with um, Kevin McPhillips in the Pennsylvania Center for Employee Ownership, as well as the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, really got an, a new concept of how ESOPs could be used as a way to promote and continue entrepreneurship and address poverty. And I've often said the largest issue in the city of Philadelphia is poverty, and I think ESOPs are just one tool of addressing that issue. And for many business owners and having you know, represented business owners as an attorney or as a banker, sometimes when they come to the end of their entrepreneurship time, want to find a way to transition from being an owner to transition that business to some of their longtime employees. And there's not always the resources enabled to do that. And so I think ESOPs and the new concept of how we're using ESOPs, and we'll talk about that today, provides an opportunity to provide a transition from an employer to employee to continue that business. Um, because what will happen sometimes if an employer does not have sufficient resources, he or she may want to retire, but their, most of their wealth is in their business. And so they may not have the ability to retire like they want to, or they may just close the business, which will then provide and call the challenge for those employees who now may become unemployed, who may have worked at that business for a number of years. So this is a way of transitioning to keep um, those businesses, especially in some of our commercial quarters. And then Councilman Parker has been a strong proponent of commercial quarter development, as well as Councilman Jones and Councilman Johnson, who are all district council members, and the at-large council members here, um, both Councilman Brown and Councilman Tomberger, who also comes from a small business perspective can really relate to that. So I think using ESOPs as a way and bring this concept to the city of Philadelphia is, is a good idea. I know it's been being used in other parts of the Commonwealth as a way of transitioning ownership from an owner to the employees and maintaining entrepreneurship and maintaining jobs in communities across the Commonwealth, but also hopefully going forward here in the city of Philadelphia. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman, for raising this issue and a worthwhile transitioning of wealth and business and opportunity and jobs and taxation. I see uh, Councilman Tollenberger would like to uh, be recognized. Yeah, I look, I look uh, forward to these hearings, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do also want to acknowledge a very uh, special uh, guest and also a, uh, a family friend uh, from uh, Windsor, Canada, Mr. Ray DeLessi. Mr. DeLessi, please stand and be recognized by my colleagues. So thank you for coming. Welcome to the city of Philadelphia. Windsor, Canada. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. So, uh, Ms. Williams, will you read? Are there any others to testify on the resolution or comment on the resolution? No? Seeing none, can you read the first panel of witnesses to testify, Ms. Williams? Kevin McPhillips, James Steiker, and William Stockwell. Again, welcome to City Council. Please have a seat at the witness table. 
Just remember when you begin your testimony, state your name for the record. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for having us. My name is Kevin McPhillips, and I'm the executive director and CEO of a relatively new nonprofit organization called the Pennsylvania Center for Employee Ownership. We exist for one purpose, to raise awareness about a remarkable program that dramatically improves the lives of citizens in Philadelphia, throughout the Commonwealth, and the nation as a whole. It's called employee ownership, and in specific, the Employee Stock Ownership Plan, or ESOP. We're here today because we want to ask you to allow us to help you and the city of Philadelphia. I'd like to begin by thanking the distinguished members of council for the opportunity to share a few thoughts, and I'd like to especially commend Councilman at Large Derek Green and his staff for taking the critically important step that you've done today to improve lives and decrease the wealth gap that is strangling so many of our citizens today. Employee ownership can help to do that. I'd like to take just a moment for a, for a personal note. I grew up in Northeast Philadelphia, and I'm proud to say that my father was a dedicated member and leader in city government for over 25 years. The city and its many extraordinary offerings were centrally important to my family and to myself, and that's why we're here today. It's within that context that I'd like to share a couple stories. In 2002, a man with a successful distribution company in the small town of Sealands Grove, Pennsylvania, turned 75. It was time to sell his business and spend more time with his wife and his family. He had 40 employees, and he considered them family as well. Unfortunately, as they were in a remote location, all offers to purchase the business included moving it away and laying off 40 people. He couldn't do that. These were his neighbors. Instead, he learned about a plan that would work. He sold the business for the same amount of money offered to his employees. His employees paid nothing. Fast forward 15 years to today, the business has over 200 employees, and all 40 of the original employees have more than enough funds to retire today, some with seven figures. That's warehouse workers, truck drivers, laborers, office assistants, as well as management. In a Forbes magazine story last year, it was related that two twin sisters graduated school in Oregon and went to work at a fast food establishment. After one year, they received a five cent raise. They knew that was not sustainable, so they went to a local grocery store called Winco. Winco's kind of like an Aldi on the West Coast, seeking employment. The grocery chain was an employee-owned company, but they only had one opening. So one sister took a job there, stocking shelves, and another sister took an administrative job at a law firm. Both worked hard and both prospered. Fast forward 23 years. The sister at the law firm regularly contributed to her 401k program, and by the age of 43, had almost $70,000 saved. Very good for someone uh, at such a young age. The sister at the grocery store, which was employee-owned, did not participate in their 401k plan, but rather did have an ESOP account. At the age of 43, still stocking shelves overnight, she had just over $1 million in her account, and had contributed none of her own money. So what is this program? Well, in 1974, Congress passed a law that is part of ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. The law says that an owner can sell some or all of their business, 10%, 20%, 49%, or even 100% to their employees. The employees pay nothing. Rather, the business takes on a note, a mortgage, if you will, to pay off the owner over time. The federal government and the state of Pennsylvania turn around and say, look, if you do this and you meet certain business requirements, you never have to pay taxes again on your profits for whatever portion is owned by the employees. The tax savings serve to pay off the mortgage. Once paid, those funds can be used for any number of things, most particularly growth. Some of the successful companies right here in Philadelphia that are employee-owned include Pannoni Associates, many of whom are here today, the Graham Company, also here today, McKean Defense, down at the Navy Yard, Urban Engineers, Cardone, Trans-American Office Furniture, Almo Corp, and Crown Cork and Seal. Yet in all of Philadelphia, 
There are less than two dozen in total. Other recognizable employee-owned companies include Wawa, Sheets, which is the sort of the Wawa of the Western PA, uh, the Dance Go Shoe Company in Westchester, or Chester County, uh, Bradford White Water Heaters, right in uh, Montgomery County, New Belgium Beer, King Arthur Flower, and Publix, the largest uh, grocery store chain in the nation. And yet, very few people know about ESOPs, and even few of them uh, understand it. In private industry, the days of real pensions are largely over. As the baby boomers age, we are on the cusp of a silver tsunami. It's estimated that 4.5 million companies will transact over the next 10 years, 4.5 million. And yet, 30% of business owners over the age of 55 have no succession plan, none. Worse yet, 30% of employees over the age of 55 have zero retirement savings, none. And fully 60% of American workers over 55 have less than $50,000. So what's going to become of our citizens? What's the future of Social Security? How will they be cared for and who's going to pay for it? Employee ownership offers a stark contrast. Based on a recent report from the, economic, the Report on Economic Well-Being by the nonprofit National Center for Employee Ownership out of Oakland, employee owners have 30% higher wages, 30% higher wages than non-employee owners. On average, two and a half times higher retirement five times longer job tenure, and are 92% less likely to be laid off. Those numbers, council member, are exaggerated within women and minority populations. Today you're gonna to hear from a recognized national legal expert, my colleague James Steiker, on the community value of employee ownership. We're gonna hear from a fourth generation Philadelphia company CEO, Mr. William Stockwell, who chose to keep his company here in Philadelphia. And most importantly, you're going to hear from the company employees whose lives have been changed forever. Members of council, here's what employee ownership can do for the city of Philadelphia. It will keep jobs and companies here. ESOP companies are on average much more productive. Surprise, surprise. That means job growth. Job growth means an increase in the tax base. Employee ownership will contribute to retirement and correcting wealth disparity and it will not cost the city a thing. We're asking the council for four things. Number one, we ask you to put the full weight of your voices and your public relations engine behind supporting and getting people to know about an option, which is employee ownership. Number two, we're asking the council to connect us to city departments that can help us to get the word out. Number three, we ask the council to connect us to your partners outside of the city that may help us get the word out. We work closely with Rob Wonderling and the um, uh, Philadelphia Chamber, but we would love some help in getting, getting coordinated. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we ask the members of council to help us to identify the businesses within your districts. You know your neighborhoods. We don't know them. Help us to enter, uh, understand the businesses that might value hearing this message so that we can help them understand a really important option. We're keenly aware that there are critical issues facing the city and council. Education, poverty, race, lead in the water we heard about this morning. We recognize that those are critical issues and by a far margin deserve your critical attention. But what's common about all of those issues is that the solutions are immensely complex. Employee ownership is low-hanging fruit. The program is there. The solution exists today, and it's just that no one knows about it. The Pennsylvania Center for Employee Ownership is a volunteer collective of current and former CEOs with experience in employee ownership, quite frankly, just looking to pay it forward. We're supported by foundations like the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, universities such as Rutgers, the University of California, Chatham University in Pittsburgh, and by volunteer industry experts, many of whom are here today. I'm gonna to ask the employee owners and the employee ecosystem friends who are here to just raise your hand and let the council know that you're here today. Nice. Members of council together, let's create a rational economy that works for everyone. We can make Philadelphia a vanguard city for employee ownership and a model for the rest of the country. Let's change some lives. We're here to get to work. I thank you for your kind attention 
and we're here at your assistance. <coughs> um, we're sitting here blown away as to, and, uh, as to the potential utility uh, for Thank a you. tool like this in economic development. A uh, question, couple of questions if I, if I could, uh, Councilman Green. How do you interact with the City of Philadelphia's Commerce Department today? Uh, thank you. A uh, wonderful cr uh, question, uh, Councilman. Uh, today, um, our, our entire uh, focus or our entire efforts have been thanks to Councilman Green, who reached out to us and said, I want to learn some more about it. And he was kind enough to suggest that we create some hearings. We're at the very start of something here. That's, that, you know, we're, we're about a year and a half old, and we're kind of getting our feet on the ground right now. Our purpose here today is to ask you the same question, please. Okay, that's fair. Uh, I want to recognize the uh, uh, presence of Councilman Dom and Councilwoman Blackwell, who have joined us here today. I knew you, you couldn't be far away. <laughs> but we have the, uh, in, in, uh, one other question. Certainly. Um, so I think of companies like Toys R Us and others that have been in the news lately. Could something like this have helped a Toys R Us if it was local and smaller? Oh, uh, if it was local and small, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the issues around Toys R Us were immensely complex. They were own, owned by a large private equity firm. Uh, they had been a public company. Um, it, the answer to that question is it depends. But the answer to, but the answer to could have it saved dozens of other companies, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. All right, I'm going to stop because I got too excited and let the other panelists testify uh, before we take questions. But I just want you to know um, you're on our radar now. So Thank you. So I'm sorry. Please uh, state your name and begin your testimony. Good afternoon. I'm James Steiker. I'm the founding chairman and CEO of SES Advisors and Steiker Green Apple and Fusco. I'm a resident of Philadelphia since 1985 when I returned to the area to accept a position with Pace of Philadelphia, a not-for-profit organization then that promoted employee ownership in Philadelphia. So I will say everything old is new again. <laughs> and uh, yesterday was actually the 30th anniversary of the founding of my firm as an enterprise dedicated to creating and serving employee-owned companies. Our firms currently assist more than 500 employee-owned companies across the nation. And over my career, I've had the opportunity to assist hundreds of companies in the transition to employee ownership, including many of the companies testifying and present here today. To me, the benefits of employee ownership to employees and local companies are obvious, both to the eye and also from the available data. Research from and sponsored by the National Center for Employee Ownership uh, www.nceo.org, which is a not-for-profit, shows that employee ownership makes companies more productive, more stable, less prone to bankruptcy or default on bank loans, and more likely to hire and grow. Same research also shows that employees and employee-owned companies have higher levels of pay and benefits, including conventional retirement benefits and significantly higher levels of overall wealth. We live in an era where capital and jobs are highly mobile. When I have the opportunity to present and roll out employee ownership at companies that choose this direction, like Bill Stockwell's company, he'll talk about this, the sense of opportunity is obvious, but so is the sense of relief that a business has committed to its people to rooting itself in the community as a stable and prosperous enterprise. Our firm connects with many entrepreneurs, most of them aging baby boomers, considering what will happen to their companies as they age and transition. We see them often presented with fast money <coughs> offers from private equity, parentheses, as, like Toys R Us, and other buyers that tend to make major changes to the company, often to the detriment of current employees and the community. Many of these entrepreneurs have been unaware that there's another path that allows them to receive fair value for their companies, but also reward their employees and anchor jobs in the community. Federal government provides significant tax incentives to encourage ESOP formation. 
Our biggest obstacle is lack of knowledge in the business community of this alternative and the sense that this is not a mainstream choice. I talk every day to business owners who tell me they did not know about ESOPs and wonder why more people do not do this. This is where local governments can help at little cost. The city of Philadelphia already funds significant business development and business retention efforts. Simply providing information and legitimately about the ESOP employee ownership alternative will cause more entrepreneurs and companies to be aware of this possibility and will create more stable and prosperous employee-owned companies in the city of Philadelphia. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Pull the mic to you. State your name for the record. William B. Stockwell. And I just realized I'm an aging baby boomer. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Stockwell Elastomerics is a fourth-generation, privately held manufacturing business founded in 1919 and located in Northeast Philadelphia. We have 85 full-time employees, including management, professional engineering, staff, and production employees. Most of our employees live in this city. We are a successful urban manufacturing business. We started in my great-grandfather's garage in Palmyra, New Jersey. In 1920, we moved to 6th and Arch Street in 1950, we moved to a carved out series of row homes on Shackamaxon Street in Fishtown. Hmm. And in 1981, we moved to our current location on Talbot Street, which is close to the Academy Road exit of I-95 in Northeast Philadelphia. My name is Bill Stockwell, and I've been active in the business since 1978, and president of the company since 1980. We've undertaken many strategic cha changes over the 99-year history, such as in 2001 through 2004, when we adopted a rapid response business model to successfully compete against Asian competition in the business-to-business -business technology equipment sector. In contrast, many other mid-sized manufacturers decided to set up production facilities in Asia during that same time frame. Our custom gaskets can be found on SpaceX Falcon 9 rockets, Baxter Healthcare's renal therapy devices, Raytheon's Excalibur guided artillery, Hubble Lighting's outdoor LED lighting fixtures, and many other applications that we and our company often take for granted. Our business is growing due to its strengthening, to do strengthening three strategic areas by selling, by our selling efforts to, on uh, key customers in niche markets within the technology sector through developing an unmatched ability to serve key customers by institutionalizing a rapid response model to provide prototypes and initial production to OEMs in the business-to-business -business technology sector. And third, by developing our workforce to help us grow our organization and more recently, teaching holistic life skills to reduce absenteeism and build their success in business and at home. At 63 years old and the last Stockwell in the business, I'm still running the business while developing leadership to fulfill my succession for the next three to five years. I believe our business model is best served by having ownership on site. Leadership needs to have skin in the game to accomplish what we do daily in our fast-paced market. A few years ago, I began evaluating transition strategies that would provide the best opportunity for the company to continue its mission in Philadelphia for many decades to come. I was, and still am, often approached by private equity groups and strategic buyers and, f and financed management groups. However, None of those options would guarantee sustaining the legacy we choose to leave for future generations of Philadelphians. Our customers, the local business community, employees, and their families would be compromised if we were to downsize or be relocated. In fact, I've observed many ownership transitions to private equity that didn't turn out well for the remaining employees 
and customers of the business. An ESOP transition was the best alternative for our situation. Some people told me, so what? What do you owe these people? Take the money, take the best offer and run, you've done enough. However, I believe the regularity of work and regularity of pay the company provides its production staff are the foundation for the successful lifestyles many of our employees have achieved for the first time in their lives. There are men and women in my company I've worked side by side with for 10, 20, and 30 years. So we've chosen a different path. On August 10th, 2017, we closed our transaction to start the Stockwell Elastomerics Perpetuity Employee Stock Option or Stock Ownership Trust. We transitioned 30% of the stock into the trust. And over the next two or three years, we intend to transition more. None of the good we must accomplish in the business and the ESOP will happen without growth. Therefore, we also broke ground on an additional building to give the business the running room it needs to continue its growth. We still have lots to do to become a mature ESOP. An ownership culture requires education. We are starting with the conversations about building culture, how to relate to each other. We have quite a melting pot in our business, but we're all Stockwell Blue. We turn 100 years old next year, and we're still building our future. In closing, I have spoken with other CEO owners with strong connections to their legacies, their people, and customers. I know of other CEO owners who recognize they have saved lives by hiring entry-level people from the neighborhoods. Philly manufacturers have an opportunity to make a hire and save a life, wow. and thereby save a family and build a neighborhood. Thank you. Well, um, I'm going to let the author of this uh, resolution, I, I can only say thank you uh, for what you're doing for the city of Philadelphia, um, but individuals, uh, families as well. And is this a peculiarity of people that are like you, 100 years old, and you don't look a day over, over 35, but 100-year-old <laughs> companies, or is it just a phenomenon in your portfolio of companies that have participated. Is, is it older companies who are like a part of the fabric of a community or is it just balanced? It, it's very much a, a mix of companies and I would say that most typically they're mid-sized companies uh, with a minimum of I would say 25 employees maybe up to a couple hundred employees. These are the more typical sort of environments. Bill has 85 employees. Uh, there are CEOs in our gallery here today who have companies that are between uh, 50 and uh, 300 employees. Uh, the Graham Company is represented here, much larger firm, uh, but um, I, I would say that it's, it's in that range. Uh, chair recognizes Councilman Graham. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank all of you for being here, um, your testimony. Um, thank you for your investment, not only in the city of Philadelphia, but also an investment in, in your people. Um, I get a couple questions. Um, this kind of an ESOP, it's, it's not a one size fit all. There are certain industries and certain businesses that are more apt to be an opportunity for an ESOP. Uh, and Councilman Jones, Chair of this committee, um, talked about you know, generational businesses, uh, family owned businesses that have grown. Uh, Mr. McPhillips, you talked about businesses from 25 to 100. Are there certain industries that are better suited? Um, from my, our conversation, it seemed like manufacturing may you, tend to be, but I don't want to make that assumption. So, and if we have, You're, if you're we correct have, about that, but I'm going to let uh, Mr. Steiker answer that first. If you looked, we, we, I've seen almost every industry, it's sort of the fun of the job is seeing the many things that people do that you had no idea they did until you walk in. But if you had to look at concentrations, you'd see three concentrations. One is manufacturing, it's particularly niche manufacturers who have found a way using quality service and delivery to compete in the global marketplace. The second niche you'll see a lot of are engineering firms and other knowledge businesses where the assets, quote unquote, walk out the door every night and they want to tie people to the company. 
And the third, interestingly enough, is you'll see distribution businesses that are working both with manufacturers and then with end user customers. And they tend to be a little bit more geographically rooted to territories and therefore are, tend to want to focus on employee ownership. And that being said, that problem, those three pieces might be 70 or 80 percent, but literally almost every other industry you can think of is represented in one way or another. Uh, has there been any outreach to organizations locally, and I'm, I'm going to focus on the manufacturing side, um, the Manufacturer Alliance of Philadelphia, um, Steve Jurash and his group, um, to kind of let them know, because I know one thing they've been trying to focus on is maintaining land in the city of Philadelphia for manufacturing and not get gobbled up by a lot of retail and development, which is housing, which is especially happening in Northern Liberty's area, but has there been any outreach to that organization at all? It, it, it's, it's, it's very coincidental you should ask that. I had a, a note from Steve Juresh this morning. He heard about the hearings, and he said, I really need to learn some more about this and would love to write an article on it. Uh, so it was an initial concept as a result, you know, thankfully of what, of what the council is doing today. Good, good. Because we worked with uh, Mr. Jurash back in my time with Councilman Tasco, trying to really promote manufacturing. I know Councilman Heenan has also worked with him, considering his district can, um, has a large part of um, areas where you see a lot of uh, industrial manufacturing activity uh, in the city. Um, one, a question I had in reference to the financing. Um, Give me some perspective of the type of entities that provide the financing. Uh, and the reason I ask that question, because we've been doing some things. Uh, I've been working with the Commerce Department where we created an initiative called the Capital Consortium, mm -hmm. which provides uh, lending to small businesses in the city of Philadelphia, almost like a lending tree type of initiative mm -hmm. for small businesses, um, pulling together about 30 different financial institutions to provide that. Um, type of financing, um, but there may be some of those banks in the institution that we're working with that may have an interest on the ESOP side. Um, so if you can give me a perspective of some of the banks that provide financing um, as well. Um, uh, thanks for asking that question. First of all, um, Councilman Green, we know you, you have very deep knowledge in the, the commercial banking industry and community banking, so we appreciate that. Uh, I just want to share, I'm going to let Mr. Steiker answer that, but, but some of the lending institutions uh, are actually here today, including Merrill Lynch, which is here. Um, Jim, you want to? Yeah, most ESOPs occur with companies that are by and large large enough to achieve some sort of conventional senior debt financing to put ESOPs together. Uh, so, and many of the large money center banks have specialists. We happen to have both Wells Fargo locally and, uh, PNC. and PNC locally that have specialists that actually sit in Philadelphia. Uh, Merrill Lynch and Jeff Harvey, who's here today, and Bank of America specializes. M&T has become very knowledgeable, involved. Several of the other banks in the region are familiar with ESOPs. Uh, the, most, the most interesting thing happening nationally is it was just recently a uh, bill passed in committee in Congress unanimously to widen the uh, Small Business Administration loan parameters for lending to ESOPs. Uh, so financing, in, at least on a conventional basis, is pretty well available. Obviously, when you're trying to save jobs with a company in distress and threatened with moving, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but for conventionally successful companies, which are the large majority of ESOPs, there's pretty good conventional financing and, available. And Councilman, just as, as, a, as a point of, of fact, um, uh, employee-owned companies' default rates are significantly lower than non-employee-owned companies, so, so the banking industry um, uh, has an interest in these kinds of loans. However, and part of our role is to try to teach as many in the expert community about these programs because not every lending institution has a department today, for example, that focuses on this particular form of knowledge. Uh, one last question, because I know my colleagues have additional questions. Has there been any discussion of having any type of either an ESOP conference, maybe with the City Commerce Department, uh, the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce, or ethnic chambers like the African American, Asian, um, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, as well as some of the financial institutions to kind of talk about these ideas to kind of raise some awareness uh, on one front? And then also, have there been any um, CLE or continuing legal education conferences on uh, ESOPs. Uh, as an attorney, I would think that you know many attorneys that do either small business um, legal work or succession planning legal work 
you know, they had a better idea of ESOPs as a exit strategy for some of their clients, that may be something that'd be more uh, attractive. Uh, and so maybe even having CLEs regarding that issue, um, you know, through either Philadelphia Bar Foundation or other entities could also help raise the awareness of this as a tool for some businesses uh, as they do succession planning. Thank you for the offer, we would love to. Um, so uh, the, the short answer is, is yes, we, we partner with a variety of organizations, economic development groups as chambers of commerce. Um, in the Philadelphia area, we have not connected with a lot. We have, for example, connected with the African American Chamber in Pittsburgh, yeah. but we have not done it here in, in, in Philadelphia. And what we really do sort of for a living, we don't, we don't sell anything or charge anything for our services. We put panels together of experts and CEOs to sit down with interested parties and teach them. And, and, and so we are looking for every opportunity to do that with any organization, uh, uh, with any individual, um, with any group. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. I uh, also want to recognize that we've been joined by Councilman O. Oh, I, I think of companies, and another life I worked for the Commerce Department for the City of Philadelphia, and I think of companies like Medley Tool and Die that used to be on Lindley Avenue. Um, and they were a minority firm who created communications uh, hubs where you built them inside of uh, a tractor trailer and then dropped them on a battlefield. They put up the antennas and th this was a company that went out of business that probably could have benefited from a program like this. The old Acme Bakery on Upland Way yeah. um, that uh, you know, it was it was cheaper to do it elsewhere. But I wonder if those employees would have had an opportunity uh, to purchase that company, maybe under another name, how that would have worked. So on this tool, we need to um, kind of let people know that it is there. Uh, and this tool uh, probably could, I mean, if we market it right, uh, generate a whole lot of uh, interest in some areas that, and no, no disrespect to condos, but you know, instead of uh, the, the factories that were um, they were meant to be, or uh, high rise, and yeah, I mean, they're called co-ops. Say it again. They're called co-ops now. Co-ops. I'm sorry, um, but I, I'd rather have my cupcakes that mm. were in uh, the Acme warehouse on my way to school. So this is a useful tool, and I'm I'm thankful to the author of this resolution for um, having the foresight to bring it to our attention. Are there any other questions? Oh, Councilman Dom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Green, and good afternoon. I have a few questions I just wanted to ask. I wanted to make sure I understood the program and give you some thoughts. Uh, first of all, on the, on the exposure, I'm sure you've gone to the Bar Association, and you should be hitting at the Bar Association attorneys who specialize in estate law and tax law and the Accounting Association also, and you should even offer CLE classes in this program so they take the course and they're gonna, be, they're gonna wanna take it. I mean, every, every lawyer has to do CLE. So you should make one of the CLEs a continuing legal education, uh, an ESOP course, uh, and Councilman Green says, great, you brought, us, brought it to council. So I would do that with the Accounting Association too. They have to take courses for certification. So that's one way of just getting it fully exposed, because I think most people selling their businesses call their lawyer, who refers them to an estate lawyer or a tax lawyer or their accountant, and they're the point of contact who can then say, this might be a good idea, just as a thought. And just so I can make sure I understand the program, which is fascinating, the federal and state taxes are waived for the whole life of the company until the loan is paid off. Well, the, the, the state and and uh, federal taxes on uh, profits um, are, are, are waived for whichever portion is in the, um, the employee trust, okay, employee okay. ownership trust. So, and, 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 um, and, and I want to clarify something. There, 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 the, the circumstances that I described here are for subchapter S companies, okay? And there could be a C Corp, there could be a subchapter S. And um, there's a, you know, I'm not sure I want to get into the weeds with you right now, but the, the benefits I described are for subchapter S companies. Go ahead, Jim. I, I was going to simply make sure that yeah. we spoke correctly. You know, subchapter S companies, the income is attributed to shareholders and ESOP as a tax-exempt pension trust. So hence, the portion of income 
in an S corporation that goes toward the ESOP as a shareholder is not fundamentally taxed. Employees pay taxes later at some point when they have distributions from the trust. And, and to answer, uh, just if I could, uh, Councilman, one other thing. Um, uh, great ideas with the Bard Association with State. Uh, two weeks ago, I was out in Pittsburgh and we did a presentation to about 100 members of the Pittsburgh Estate Planning Council. Any help we could get in connecting with those kinds of organizations through council would sure be appreciated. And, and to, to your comment and to Councilman Jones' comments, um, uh, uh, continuing ed credits are a common thing with, with our, our, our programs and our industry. Okay, we can connect you to those organizations, no Great. problem. Thank you. I have a question on the, from the banking side of things. When the banks make a loan based on the employee ownership trust, I assume they're making the, the loan based on the income of the company, the current profits. Yes. And there's no guarantees required by any of the employees to loan? Never a guarantee by employees. Uh, in, in smaller companies, sometimes the selling shareholder will be asked to provide some sort of a guarantee. It would be the same kind of credit that a company could obtain conventionally in a conventional. Right. So it's a corporate guarantee, not a personal guarantee. Correct. Okay. And do you know what the multiplier typically is, or it depends on the business of the income? Any idea or range? Two and a half to three times EBITDA would be the common parameter for senior lending. When we're selling more than a part of a company, typically the selling shareholders are providing subordinated seller financing as part of it. Okay. Thank you. It's a great program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. The chair recognizes uh, Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Jones, and just let me add my voice uh, to the chorus and uh, thanking you, Councilman uh, Green, for uh, bringing this, this concept and idea before us. Um, uh, I just saw Cardone Industries, and for those of you uh, who don't know, they are uh, the largest manufacturing firm, neighborhood-based in the wonderful, awesome, mighty Ninth Councilmatic District <laughs> in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and so um, I'm happy to know that the tool um, is available. But I really got excited when you described on uh, page two of your testimony, Mr. McPhillips, the um, its impact to retirement security. Um, you know about the shift from defined benefit pensions, moving over to defined contributions, uh, you know, therefore shifting the risk of retirement security, you know, from the, from the owners on uh, to uh, the workers. And uh, with that being said, we in the city of Philadelphia commission via the Swartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis, a report about our Philadelphians ready for retirement security. And we learned during that time that 48% um, of workers ages 25 to 64 work for an employer that sponsors a retirement plan compared to 53% nationwide. So in our city, we were um, not doing as well as the national average. And um, you mentioned ERISA uh, as the tool. So when I think ERISA, I never thought Councilman uh, Green to connect ERISA <laughs> to this kind of development, I immediately just thought about it from you know, retirement uh, uh, security perspective. So I want to say thank you, and I look forward to working with you, Councilman Green and uh, Chairman uh, Jones, and all of our colleagues to make sure that people um, know that there is a, a, another vehicle, another opportunity um, available to them for, for home ownership. We talk about self-sufficiency. We talk about self-sufficiency. I'm going to tell my age, uh, Councilman Jones, and you all don't laugh. Last night I was listening to WDAS radio station. They have a segment that's called the oldies, and I listen to it because it reminds me of my grandmother. And I'm an English teacher, so I want you to know that I am simply repeating the lyrics that are in the song. If I would have written it, it would have they would have been read a different way. The song was written by James Brown. And the lyrics went something like, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Open up the door and I'll get it myself. 
And as I'm listening to you and I'm looking at the employees who raise their hand and we talk about putting people on a path to self-sufficiency where they're not dependent on government or anyone else to take care of their families and work in dignity, you know, this is a potential path. And so I just wanted to say again, thank you, Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm looking forward to this. Well, well Councilman, just a thank correction. you. Thank to the record, you, you're not telling your age. You just Googled that song <laughs> and found it. That's all. That's all. Well, Ca Councilwoman, thank, thank you for your comments. Uh, and as, if it's any consolation, just last week, my, my wife was listening to an oldie station and asked me, why do they keep putting songs on here that aren't oldies? And, um, <laughs> uh, thank you. And um, I, I wanted to remind you, which I'm sure you, you're, you're aware of, that, that in terms of retirement, the, the employees pay nothing. They put nothing into this as opposed to a 401k, et cetera. How many 25 to 30 year olds are putting money into savings accounts today? You know, this is, this is an assurance that you're going to be okay when you're, when you're in later life. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Councilman Green? Yeah, I um, just want to follow. Uh, Mr. Stockwell, you kind of, uh, I think, I've, I've talked about this conversation as you're going through this process of uh, ESOP. How do you train and educate the workforce on a culture of ownership? Um, clearly, from your perspective and having employees who have been there for 10, 20, 30 years, they have an investment in Stockwell because they've probably grown their families and their relatives and friends and neighbors and have a deep connection from working there. But it's one thing to be an employee, but now you transition to employer well, owner, excuse me, owner of the company. So how, give me some perspective on that transition of trying to better educate the employees that now you're about to become an owner and what steps need to be taken. Uh, Councilman, that's a great question. Um, first of all, we have a quarterly gross margin distribution we make just to the, to the staff every, every quarter. But the ESOP is different. <coughs> They're basically gaining shares in the business. And at the end of the day, their valuation is based on a multiple, okay, of the value, okay? And it could be, you know, 4X, 5X, whatever, okay? So it's an interesting game. It's an interesting uh, model where they're actually looking to improve the value of the shares. And so that dollar that they're saving, that, that box that they're going to flatten and reuse later on instead of putting in the dumpster, all of that adds up. Now, teaching that, okay, is a challenge. It takes a while to really inculcate that knowledge. And so that's part of the, the cultural shift, if you will, uh, part of the education process. And this doesn't happen overnight. I mean, it's going to take a little while for it to happen. So. And this is a quite kind of broadening question to other panelists. How does that impact the future productivity of the company? Because I could see once employees become owners, they may be a little more conservative going forward and running the business because they're saying, well, I don't want to invest new dollars in this new initiative because it may not be returned. So let's continue to do the things we've done historically. But then at the same point, any business has to change with the times and, and trends. So you may have to invest dollars in some new ideas, initiatives that em employees, now owners may say, well, wait a minute, if we spend that money here, we may not get that return and it may have a negative impact and may want to stay a little more conservative as opposed to investing to new technology, new business lines. It, well, it, it's funny because what you're talking about is how any business owner wrestles anyway at 11 o'clock at night when they can't sleep, okay? Mm -hmm. um, that's why the education is so important. That's why having a broader conversation about the business, how we're going to grow the culture, whether we need to hire a couple more people or oh, maybe we should just work overtime for a week. This is all the challenge that we face as business owners and managers every day and every week. And so opening up that scope so more people are in the conversation, it's very interesting. It's educating. And, and Councilman, your, your, your comment's a really important one. Uh, uh, most times employees are not born being owners, okay? And, and there is an investment on Bill's part, on other companies' parts, in, in really teaching employees what this means. On average, employee-owned companies are 5% more productive than non-employee-owned companies. 
over a 10-year period, that's 70% more growth over a 10-year period. But that doesn't come automatically. You've got to do the kinds of things that Bill is doing. There are organizations in our network that are organizational development groups that we always recommend that do nothing other than work with ESOP companies to help employees understand you know, what this all means. And I wanted to add, just to clarify one thing. ESOP companies are conventionally managed and run. They have a board of directors, they have management. We don't have a vote every time we're going to buy a new machine or uh, invest in a, in a new piece. The data says that the highest productivity gains come from a high degree of employee involvement in a day-to-day -day basis, giving people more say and authority over what they do and what's around them, listening more to what's around them, educating them more on what makes a difference. As Bill said, when you get to the point when people understand that a dollar saved is five dollars of value in the company and that everybody benefits from that, you get a very powerful engine and a very powerful sense of teamwork. And what we're seeing is even with the millennials, all of whom, unlike us who played ball in the streets, were raised on all of the team sports and organized things, that that resonates a lot. When you tell people they're on a team and this is how the team wins, you get some very powerful responses. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We, we are sitting here just marveling at the concept and uh, can't wait to uh, see how commerce in the city of Philadelphia and the Chamber of Commerce interact with this, this, this powerful tool. Are there any others uh, to, on the panel that want to ask a question, seeing none? Thank you once again for your testimony and I, I truly appreciate you being kinder, gentler capitalists. It's okay, it's okay to be that. You know, you don't have to be a ruthless phenomenon. You can be thoughtful and still make a profit. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Williams, who do we have next? Kenneth Lazuski, John Dolan, and Mark Saloni. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Please have a seat. Pull the mics to you. Begin your testimony, and please state your name. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, members of the council. My name is Kenneth Lazuski. Uh, I was born and raised, and I still live in Philadelphia today. I'm a key account manager for New Age Industries, uh, and I work in the Advantage Pure Division is located in Southampton, Pennsylvania. And uh, we are a manufacturer. We manufacture plastic uh, single-use systems for the biopharma and biotech market. Uh, New Age Industries, Industries is a family-owned business. Uh, Ken Baker's father, Ray Baker, uh, was in business since 1954. Uh, since 2006, Ken Baker sold 49% of the company to the employees. Um, of the shares, I'm sorry, to the new AG ESOP, ensuring economic and employment stability for the, new, for the company. The ESOP provides me with a retirement plan as a team member owner. The ESOP stock ownership plan currently owns 49% New Age Industries. I've been with the company for over 20 years. I started when I was young. I was in the warehouse. I was an order puller, order picker, QC. Um, after a period of time, I was promoted to sales. Um, I became very interested in a new product line that, that we uh, ventured into, the Avantapure division. Um, so uh, when Avantapure was developed in the early 2000s, I was promoted again uh, to a technical sales representative. Uh, I accepted a role as a sales project manager and am now currently a key account manager for two of our largest customers in the company. Um, my job, I interface with all aspects of the, of the organization from product engineering, supply chain, manufacturing, prototyping, credit management. Um, I had never heard of an ESOP program before I came to New Age. When Ken Baker originally told us that the, he was moving to an ESOP company, I and many of other, other employees were a little skeptical. 
Skeptical only because at first we did not know, we didn't have the knowledge of, the, of, of what this type of business model would bring. And to be honest, it seemed too good to be true. Um, Ken brought in some consultants and we actually go through a training. Ken teach, the owner teaches, teaches the employees as well as the consultants come in and he teaches what an ESOP means and what it can mean for us in our futures. Every year we get an ESOP statement with an account balance. We also have an ESOP month as well, so we celebrate the ESOP um, in October. The share price is determined by the outside evaluation firm and is based on how well the company does over time. I like this because in a way I'm, I'm, I am in control of my retirement benefit. If the company does well, I do well as well as all the other employees. If the company doesn't do well, I don't do, as, I don't do well, and my fellow employees don't do well. This makes me and the other, and the other employees take our, take our work very, very seriously and, and, and we try to do our best at the company. I have no control over failure of other companies in my 401k statement. I actually had to go to my dad and ask him for advice on my 401ks, and I'm not the best 401k person, so I don't know the, the younger, you know, younger people, how they even move stock around and do all that, so that's, it's, it helps. Um, having worked with the company since the ESOP, uh, from, from when I started New Age Industries, there's been people there who have retired. They've actually retired a few years before they actually needed to retire because of their ESOP, ESOP, state, ESOP funds. Um, they retire because they have a robust, a robust amount of uh, uh, cash in their program that they can actually retire early. Um, the company does get a tax, tax benefit for being ESOP. Right now the company pays no tax on 49% of the company. This has allowed more money to flow into the ESOP and make our benefit accounts grow. Uh, we kid Ken every so often, hey Ken, when are you going to sell us the rest of the shares? Uh, he jokes and he says, I'm not ready yet because I'm afraid I'm going to get fired. <laughs> um, when we go to 100% e-stop, uh, which Ken said he will do someday in the future, that will mean more retirement benefit and more cash for some of our expansion plans. We've already expanded three times already when we've had the ESOP, so we are expanding our, co our company. Uh, when I talk to customers, I always mention that we're an ESOP employee-owned company. Our companies, our competitors are big, worldwide, publicly traded companies. Our customers like the fact that we're employee-owned business because we're going to stay there and they're going to have us as a, as a supplier to them and they feel that we're going to go above and beyond and they feel like they can call and talk to a person and since, since people like myself were there 20 years, they feel comfortable, they feel like it's nothing's going to change, it's always going to be the good service that they provide. So that, our customers are even telling us that they like us because of that. And being in sales guy, that, that's a big benefit to, to, to uh, the company. Um, Ken asked me to come and uh, tell my ESOP story to you uh, because he is very passionate about the ESOP and because he has seen what it has done for New Age. He told me that the city council wants us to look into promoting ESOP in the city to keep companies and jobs in the city. It's a pretty neat idea. I support the concept. It would be great if the city had more ESOP companies. Thank, Thank you. you for your story and your testimony. My name is John Dolan, and I'm with Waste Gas Fabricating. Um, honorable members of City Council, thanks for having me today. I was born and raised in this city, and I'm proud to be a Philly guy. I was educated in the Philadelphia school system and graduated from Frankfurt High School. I'm a sales manager and one of the many owners of Waste Gas Fabricating located in Farrell's Hills, PA. Waste Gas is a steel fabrication business, which would be manufacturing. We have a customer base of over 400 accounts, many of whom are located within the city of Philadelphia. We also have many suppliers that are Philadelphia-based companies that we work with. Waste Gas is an ESOP company that is 100% owned by its employees. 
We currently have 80 employees who will participate in company ownership. We have 12 employees who are working towards their goal of meeting qualifications to participate in the program. I, for one, am very proud to be one of the owners of Waste Gas. Waste Gas was founded in 1976 by Kyle Kloman and his father James Kloman as a small family business. Kyle is currently our president and CEO. In 2007, Kyle and his wife Ruthann decided they wanted to transition Waste Gas into an ESOP company to benefit the, the loyal employees and give them an opportunity to put money aside for their retirement. The initial offering to us in 2007 was 30 percent ownership of the company. In 2013, Kyle and Ruthann again awarded the employees with an additional 70 percent stake in ownership, making us a 100 percent employee-owned company. Kyle and Ruth Ann both understood the success of Waste Gas was only as good as its employees and wanted to reward their loyal employees with a secure future and were looking for a way to transfer ownership in the company while maintaining it for the employees and assuring them that the location would stay in Fairless Hills and continue to benefit them. Employee ownership was the vehicle that they choose to arrange these goals. What has the conversion of employee ownership done for Waste Gas? I have four points. One is teamwork. Just like our Super Bowl champion, Philadelphia Eagles, everyone plays together and works together as a team. Employee ownership enhances teamwork among employees. Our tenured employees mentor our younger and new employees. The workforce helps and assists each other when needed, even if it's not their job. Our employees make it their job and jump right in to accomplish goals. Everyone has a stake in the game. Job retention and stock shares. Employees are owners and now have a vested interest in the company. One of the benefits of ownership is having stock in the company. The stock is valued and it's based on the company's performance each year. Being an employee, we all understand that we need to perform our duties to the best of our ability to make the company and the ESOP prevail. Personally, I look forward to opening my ESOP statement at the end of the year. The fact that I'm being given this benefit at no cost to me with the knowledge that I am saving money for my family and my future gives me a great sense of security and appreciation. Productivity. Ownership creates personal attention and enhances buy-in. I'm proud to say our employees have been a cut above over the years, but as owners now, we've moved to another level of responsibility and effort. Our attitude towards the whole business has evolved into a more positive environment of caring and sharing with one another. Uh, we are proud of the contribution and it, and it shines in our quality metrics and our positive customer feedback. And then finally, retirement planning, which is, which is really tough these days. At the end of the day, the ESOP program has been a blessing for me. Paying a mortgage and college tuition along with the normal everyday bills we all incur make it difficult to save money and think about retirement without feeling the pressure. The ESOP has alleviated some of the pressures and concerns I have about my retirement. It has made my dream to retire and own a home at the shore with my wife a reality. When I joined the company 26 years ago, it never occurred to me that I would be compensated for my years of service and be part owner of such a tremendous company. The ESOP has provided me with peace of mind, giving me confidence that in the future my family and I will have additional revenue that would not have been possible without the vision of Kyle and Ruth Ann Kloman initiating this ESOP program. I am thankful that I came to work for a company where the owners truly care about their employees. I'm proud to be an employee owner and part of a great company. I strongly endorse ESOP. Thank you for your time today. He strongly endorses. I like that. Councilman Green? Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Mark Saloni. I'm a professional engineer, civil engineer, serving as vice president and Philadelphia office director for Pannoni. Pannoni is a 100% employee-owned firm, and since, 19, since 2015, I've also served as a trustee for Pannoni's employee stock ownership plan. Uh, our founder and chairman, Chuck Pannoni, submitted uh, written testimony separate, uh, which gave a lot of details and background about the company. Uh, I'm going to tell a more personal story as someone that's lived through the ESOP. Uh, but before I do that, I did want to recognize some of my few co-workers that are here as representatives from Pannoni, if they could stand while I read a statement. Okay. There are several others here today. Uh, who have collectively accumulated well into seven figures total in this part of their retirement planning. Could As you repeat that, please? There are several others who are here today, and I say please stand to be recognized, who have collectively 
accumulated well into seven figures total as part of their ESOP retirement planning. As you can see, they are at various stages of their professional careers. Like them, there are many other Pannoni employees at all levels of the firm that have similarly benefited and will continue to benefit from the ESOP program. Thank you. I was born and raised in the Roxburgh neighborhood of Philadelphia and have lived and completed my education and worked in the city for my entire life. I began my engineering career in the mid-1980s as a Drexel co-op, working first for the city of Philadelphia and then for Pannoni. I've worked full-time at Pannoni since 1988. My father was a war veteran and also lived in the city his entire life. He worked as a civil engineer for the streets department and water departments for 30 years. As a grandson of Italian immigrants to this great city, education and improving oneself and community has always been important in our family structure. Today, I will give an example of how that lives on at Pannoni. Pannoni, as many of you know, is a multidisciplinary engineering firm with 1,200 employees working from 35 offices along the East Coast. Our firm was founded in 1966, more than 52 years ago, by Chuck Pannoni, and has always kept its headquarters located here in Philadelphia. Pannoni recently invested one and a half million dollars in a newly expanded headquarters space at 1900 Market Street and is looking to grow by adding to the 180 employees at this location. Pannoni's breadth of services include civil site, construction services, environmental, geotechnical, landscape architecture, planning, MEP, structural, survey and ge geomatics, transportation, water resources, and water wastewater. The three founding goals of Pannoni are excellent professional reputation, profit, and growth. These goals, along with the pillars of honesty, integrity, and service, define the culture of Pannoni. Keeping that culture alive as the firm transitioned its ownership to an ESOP was really important. I can remember attending a Saturday morning seminar in the early 1990s at the Community College of Philadelphia to learn more about ESOPs. As education is also extremely important to Chuck Pannoni, he asked an expert on the subject to explain how an ESOP works and how the ownership of the company would transition to the employees. It was the right choice, as the culture of the company remained unchanged as the ownership transitioned. This is often not the case if the owner decides to sell to another owner or outside investors. Equally important, the ESOP allowed the company to continue to successfully grow, and right here in Philadelphia. The growth provided opportunity for employees that remained with the firm. The growth of the company has benefited the employee owners who have seen their ESOP retirement accounts increase in value. The Philadelphia community has also benefited from Pannoni's growth as it has allowed the firm and its employees to participate in and donate to many charitable organizations and causes. One of the reasons I'm still employed at Pannoni after 30 years is due to the growth and success of our business. Unlike friends and many other companies, I, didn't leave, I did not need to leave my firm to find opportunity. I consider myself fortunate. I don't know if I would be part owner of a firm if I didn't work at an ESOP company. It has given me a retirement benefit that will greatly improve the financial stability of my family. It also makes me proud to be able to work in the city that I grew up in at a company that serves the community well. With an ESOP in place, we dedicate ourselves to daily client service, to giving back to the community, and to nurturing the entrepreneurial spirit of our employee owners. 
There's a very healthy culture and attitude at Pannoni, which can be credited to its founder and leadership. The ESOP has allowed this culture to continue because our employees recognize that the performance of their own accounts is directly related to the success of the firm. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in, your, in the panel, thank the panel for being here and showing your representation in um, both the employees and also the panelists. Um, two things that came out in the testimony that I did not really think about. One, the different types of ESOPs in reference to some go 100% employee ownership, others take some time to transition. Um, and I think you said that um, New Age will be going to 100% in the, in the future, but it's 50, it's 49% Correct, it's 49, um, Correct. It's 49 now and the future will be 100%. Right. So um, was that a strategic decision to do 51, 49? as opposed to a full 100 percent. And then also you, you and I think others may have talked about the marketing aspect of them being employee owned. Uh, and it makes me think of, you know, some years ago when I was in banking, you, you, the banking industry changed dramatically where you had, you know, at one point regional banks, I used to work for Meridian Bank, that was a regional bank, that three smaller banks came together. But then you look at the late 90s through 2000s, um, a lot of these smaller banks got acquired by much larger institutions. And now you're starting to see a reverse where smaller banks are getting more um, interest. So you look at the Valley Green Bank that was recently acquired by Univest, that was started by people locally in Mount Airy. You have other smaller banks that are moving into um, the city of Philadelphia, um, BB&T, Susquehanna, uh, some others. Uh, so you're starting to see people want to have that personal touch. And when you have a large institution, um, people don't feel they have that same type of connection. In fact, there's an article today about Vanguard, who brings in about a billion dollars per day, and they're very successful because their fees are so low, but people are concerned from a customer service perspective because they can't reach anybody. So having that type of employee ownership, and when you're in sales and you're saying that to your customers, I think is a benefit. So I'm curious in the perspective how that's changed going from um, being uh, entrepreneur owned to now employee owned. Um, for all the business, how that's improved from a marketing business perspective, as well as the diversity of 100% to 49%. So, so as far as the, uh, the marketing uh, part of it for, for us is the, so the shares, the shares have grown. So, so prior to that, when customers would talk to us, they, they have, we call them the, the big boys in the industry, where they just eat up, they, they come in with their checkbooks, they call on the phone, ask to buy, buy, buy. We want to buy you, we want to buy you. We want to subsidize, we just want your building, we just want your land, we just want your contact list. So a lot of our, our customers, they, they need us. So they, and, and, we, and we do a good job for them. They make money because we make money for them. So. What happens is, is these big companies will come in, they'll buy the smaller company, they lay off all the employees. We deal with the biofarm biotech industry, and if we just don't supply them products, it causes a big, big uh, problem for them with validations and getting another and validating another customer. They know the employees very well, and you know they come in, they visit, they they tend to talk more about the ESOP sometimes than we even talk about actually doing the visits and doing the sales calls because they're actually interested in it and then they're actually going back to their employees and saying, hey, why can't we beat an ESOP? So I don't know if, and as far as the 100% the to the 49%, um, our CEO's over there, so I guess I'll, I, I can have one of these guys answer that question. Gotcha, all right, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this group? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Um, Ms. Williams, are there any others to testify on this resolution? There are uh, no other witnesses to testify on this resolution, but there will be written testimony submitted by C.R. Chuck Pannoni, Kenneth Baker, and Edward D'Alba. Thank you, Ms. Williams. If I could just please. Yes, Councilwoman Reynolds-Brown. I've been here now for over a decade, we'll say that. And um, I often get excited at new, innovative, uh, out-of-the-box, novel business opportunities that really help those who work, live and work in Philadelphia. So the, this is a new concept for me. Councilman Green has worked in banking, and, and so it's part of his DNA. 
but to have sit here and listen to the 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 the, the quiet uh, energy, but but um, sense of humility and and enthusiasm that 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 an opportunity has been provided to people so that they can feed their families. And because we know that owning a piece of dirt is the American dream. And um, that's my, my mother's favorite term, owning a piece of dirt. And so to know that you have leaders, owners, who saw that as a good thing to do, a good business model, for me is ex exceedingly exciting. And I, and I commend the owners and the employees who, who are fortunate to have, you know, by the luck of the draw, end up with a company yep. where the leadership and the ownership thought, this is a good business model, let's do it. So hats off to all of you who've spoken on this very novel business idea. For Blondell, but I'm sure with Councilman Green, it, it will, he's gonna figure out a way to drill down so that it can manifest itself in so many other ways across uh, the city. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, your point is well taken. You don't want to be the employee of Blockbusters at the end of the day. Uh, and so we thank you uh, for, for your testimony. Are there any other people here to testify on resolution number 170971? Seeing none, thank you again for your testimony. Will the clerk now read the title of the bill uh, being considered today? Bill number 170956, an ordinance amending chapter 171300 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Philadelphia 21st Century Minimum Wage and Benefit Standard. By revising provisions regarding waivers of minimum wage requirements, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, we'd like to hear from the author of this bill, uh, Councilman Johnson. Thank you, Council President. Mm. Oh, start, start. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill um, focuses on uh, bringing a particular company at the airport in compliance with the 21st century wage bill that we passed um, a couple of years ago. We worked diligently to address the issue of raising the airport workers out of poverty. Um, we talk about uh, making sure that here in the city of Philadelphia we are producing jobs. We want to make sure that we're producing good paying jobs. We want to make sure that individuals who are working at the Philadelphia International Airport, who are the backbone of that airport, have the opportunity to improve the quality of their lives and not live um, check to check in poverty. And so um, I want to thank all of, thank you, Council, Mr. Chairman, um, for um, bringing up this bill in this particular hearing. And we will hear from the individuals from the airport. Uh, we'll hear from the advocates who are organizing around this issue. And you'll hear from the actual company um, who hasn't been in compliance. But nevertheless, um, our goal here today is to address this issue to um, do right by the workers at the Philadelphia International Airport. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman. And I think it's very important that as all boats float, the tide rises. Uh, uh, how do you say that? Uh, and um, it's important to hear from all sides on this issue, and I appreciate you offering this bill. Ms. Williams, will you please read the names of the first panel to testify? James Engler. Mr. Engler, how are you today? Good, Chairman. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for your patience. Would you uh, state your name for the record and please begin your testimony? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Jones, and members of the Commerce and Economic Development Committee. My name is Jim Engler, and I am the Deputy Mayor for Policy and Legislation. And I am here today to testify on Bill 170956, which revises provisions regarding waivers of minimum wage requirements. I am joined here today by Manny Citron, Chief of Staff in the Office of Labor and Acting Chair of the Living Wage and Benefits Review Committee. The Philadelphia 21st Century Minimum Wage and Benefit Standards was originally passed in 2005, and with subsequent amendments, this wage standard has been applied to the city and its contractors and subcontractors with the goal of ensuring workers receive hourly wage that enables them to live with dignity and increase self-sufficiency. The mayor joins with you on this committee and all of council in supporting a living wage for all workers in Philadelphia, and most specifically those whose business is directly tied to that of the city or its contractors. The code does, however, envision a number of situations that would allow for an entity to apply for a waiver from the requirement. This includes the allowance of a waiver if there is a bona fide collective bargaining agreement. Bill number 170956 would remove from the exemption any agreements governed by the Railway Labor Act. 
As a note, since 2016, the Living Wage and Benefits Review Committee has granted five waivers because of the existence of a bona fide collective bargaining agreement. Should this legislation receive the approval of City Council, the administration, and the Living Wage and Benefits Review Committee stand ready to enforce it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Um, are you testifying today? Uh, no, sir. Manny Citron, Chief of Staff in the Mayor's Office of Labor. I'm here if there's any questions. Okay. All right. Uh, are there any questions, Councilman? No? Seeing none. Uh, Ms. Williams? We please read the next panel to testify on this bill. Rosalyn Wichenick and Daniel Bowder. Philosophy. You come on up. Got it. Welcome. Please bring the mic a little closer to you. State your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Right. Jever. Okay. Two, two polite people. I like that. Uh, I'm Rosalyn Wachinick, president of Unite Here, Local 274. Welcome. Thank you. Begin your testimony. Okay. Um, so thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. We applaud the work of this committee and the Philadelphia City Council in ensuring that more and more workers are covered by the 21st century minimum wage standard. The expansion of the minimum wage standard has transformed the lives of thousands of workers at the airport and the lives of their families, as well as our communities in Philadelphia. We are here today to close a loophole in that law. For months, airport workers employed by LSG Sky Chefs who prepare meals primarily for American Airlines have spoken to you and your colleagues about their pride in working at the Philadelphia International Airport. And you will hear again from them today. In December of 2017, when this group of workers spoke to the Living Wage and Benefit Review Committee, they spoke of earning as little as $7.90 an hour well below the 21st century minimum wage standard, which is today 12.20 an hour. In fact, 79% of the LSG Sky Chefs employees earned less than the standard that you set. They have earned less than the standard ever since this council acted to ensure that workers at the Philadelphia International Airport would finally earn a fair wage. LSG Sky Chefs is exploiting the loophole that we're asking you to close today by passing this bill. LSG Sky Chefs, like many airline-related contracts, is governed by the Railway Labor Act, or the RLA. Bargaining contracts under the Railway Labor Act differs significantly from bargaining under the National Labor Relations Act, or NLRA. However, the 21st century minimum wage law, as currently written, does not recognize that difference. Under the RLA, terms of a contract do not expire. They merely become amendable in a long, federally mediated process where workers do not have the right to strike. That means that workers do not have the same options to adapt their contracts to local laws upon a clear expiration of existing contract terms. In the case of LSG Sky Chefs, the company has not agreed to the workers' ongoing demand to be paid the city's minimum. No company should have the unilateral and unending right to impose a wage below the city's minimum for other airport workers. A simple amendment as proposed by Councilmember Johnson to close the loophole for the RLA context would ensure that workers seeking to be paid the minimum intended by law will be respected. Now LSG Sky Chefs will most likely tell you today that the company is now planning to pay the minimum currently required by the law. Finally, after four years of paying over $4 an hour below the minimum set by the 21st century minimum wage standard, and only after the hearing last December, has the company now indicated willingness to pay the current minimum wage as of this coming Friday, April 6, 2018. But true to form, they have only agreed to do so for this year. 
They have refused to commit in writing that they will follow the law next year or the year after that or the year after that. For workers who have already waited too long for a standard that should have been implemented by LSG sky shifts years ago, it is simply unconscionable that they will not commit to follow the law in the future and to make sure that workers are not left behind again. That's why, even though the company has indicated a willingness to finally meet the minimum now, we continue to ask the committee to move this legislation forward and to close the loophole once and for all, permanently. These workers have been left behind for too long. This company has shown over and over again that we'll only respect the law if required to. Thank you for your support and for making sure no workers are left behind in the future. Thank you for your testimony. Are you testifying, sir? Yes, I am, Councilman. Bring that a little closer to you and then state your name for the record and begin your testimony. I am Daniel Bowder. Good afternoon, Chairman Jones and members of this committee. As I stated, Daniel Bowder, campaign manager for the Philadelphia Council AFL-CIO. And on behalf of our member unions and 150,000 workers in Philadelphia, I'm here to testify in favor of Bill 170956. In the last few years, workers have won hard-earned victories at our airport. I say our airport because, as you know, Philadelphia International Airport is a city-owned and operated facility. We're proud of our world-class airport and that, that has such a talented and diverse workforce. We are proud that that workforce is earning a living wage and that our city council continues to raise the standard of living for working people. But this isn't a story for all workers at our airport. Unfortunately, hundreds of workers at LSG Sky Chefs are being shut out from the gains that others have made. These workers deserve equity and fair treatment by their employer. In other cities like Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles that have passed similar wage legislation, LSG Sky Chefs has followed the law and raised worker wages. I've heard directly from workers that the turnover is so high at LSG Sky Chefs because of the low pay. I can't believe that a company wouldn't want to reduce, reduce their turnover and stop losing talented workers over below market wages. That's why I'm here to testify in favor of Bill 170956, amending the 21st Century Wage and Benefit Ordinance to protect all workers at the airport. Hundreds of workers for LA, LSG Sky Chefs are being excluded from our city's living wage, and this body has the power to fix it. I urge Council to close this loophole to ensure that workers aren't being excluded from the gains that we have all worked for. The Philadelphia Council AFL-CIO stands with these workers and asks you to pass Bill 170956. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, question. When did we pass the wage increase? I'm thinking, what? 13. When? Yeah, yeah. so that's at least two uh, years ago? 2013, I believe, Council. 2013. And what is the difference between that minimum wage and what is proposed by law? What is proposed by law? Our or? minimum wage. What, it, what was it? What have they been paid on average? Oh, okay. Compared to what the the, the, the minimum, um, well, the current minimum right now is eight dollars and ten cents um, as of 2018, and um, the current rate is twelve dollars and twenty cents. So multiply that by the time mm -hmm. that they have not received it, that means individual workers lost how much money? We've done some just back of the envelope calculations that a number of workers have lost probably as much as $20,000 over the last, just few years, not since 2013 even. We were looking back um, just over the last two to three years. Um, and of course, as you know, when you're earning, uh, your wages are so low, um, $20,000 is, is a lot more to somebody that's earning $15,000 a year than to somebody earning $100,000 a year. Thank you, are there any questions? Seeing none, Mrs. Williams, can you bring up the next panel of uh, witnesses to testify? Felicide Alana Pekin Lewis and Bruce Murray. And Alan Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. 
Felicity, you're no stranger here, so. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, council members. Um, good afternoon, Councilman Jones. Um, Chairman Jones and members of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. I am Falashide Olani Pekun Lewis. I'm the new Regional Director for Government, Affair, Government Airport Affairs with American Airlines. And I'm here today to provide remarks regarding resolution number 170956. This resolution would amend Philadelphia's 21st century minimum wage and benefit standard code by revising provisions regarding waivers of minimum wage requirements. Currently, companies with collective bargaining agreements are allowed to seek a waiver from the city's living wage, which is discretionary under the code. This amendment, however, would exclude any company that is governed by the Railway Labor Act and thereby unfairly singling out airline companies that conduct business with the city of Philadelphia. While noticeably silent about the continued right to seek waivers by all other companies engaged in, in collective bargaining, this amendment unfairly and unnecessarily exclusively targets and penalizes airlines, such as American Airlines, engaging in collective bargaining and by eliminating any right to similarly seek waivers. It was not long ago American Airlines worked with the city to accept living wage standards and promote labor harmony. We agreed because we work in partnership with the city, positioning ourselves as a major international gateway and economic driver of the Philadelphia region. In short, airlines who have worked directly with members of council and with the mayor to address labor issues should not now be singled out from the discretionary waiver process under the city's living wage code, as is so clearly and unambiguously the purpose of this amendment. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, Sade said it all. Um, now that she's sitting on the other side of the room, yeah, I'm, noticing. I'm just Sunday. here as it's her like it feels funny. Don't, I'm, don't I'm, here, feel I'm right. here as her protector, or maybe it's the other way around. She protects me. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Kessler, I'm sorry. Are you, and I'm is, outside counsel to American well, Airlines. Mr. Butler, are you speaking? Excuse me. Uh, my name is Franklin Bruce Murray. Oh, I'm oh. here. Excuse me. Oh, my name is Can Franklin Bruce. Your name for the microphone, please. Franklin Bruce Murray. I'm here on behalf of LSG Sky Chefs, and thank you, council members, uh, and the uh, council community uh, commerce and economic. Development Committee for allowing us to speak to you today. Mm -hmm. uh, here are the concerns that LSD Skies has uh, with the proposed amendment to the 20, to Philadelphia 21st Century Minimum Wage and Benefit Standards Ordinance. The current ordinance acknowledges the right of employees, employers and employees to negotiate in the area of wages and benefits and provides uh, a venue for the employer and the union to waive the ordinances, uh, wages and benefits requirements through the collective bargaining process. The purpose of this amendment targets, targeted a goal to restrict the collective bargaining only for those employers who are governed by the, the railway, the National Railway Act, the National Labor Relations Railway Act. And by virtually dictating the results of collecting bargaining in the areas while allowing those employers under the National Labor Relations Act to negotiate freely on these points as it was contemplated by federal law. This effectively creates a legislatively dictated terms of employment for some unionized workforces, but not for others. There is no legislated, no legitimate or rational basis for the disparate uh, restriction on bargaining for one group of unionized employers and employees over another. Carving out an exception to the ordinance for only RLA employers may seriously disadvantage certain unionized employees over the others. Since the National Labor Relations Act employers will be able to freely negotiate in the areas of wages and benefits in RLA employers will not have this ability. Employee, 
employees' recruitment and retention will be affected. Collective bargaining negotiations are based on give and takes of dollars, amounts, and terms and conditions. If waivers, if wages and benefits are not subject to negotiation because of these, this resolution, it leaves the union as well as the employer at a disadvantage because there is less area for the parties to bargain over and limits the flexibility of bargaining parties in making arriving at an agreement much more difficult. LSG Sky Chef, an RLA employer, has been negotiating in good faith with Unite here for years. And we believe that, that we're making progress in this area. If the resolution were to be adopted, the efforts of our negotiations will be severely impacted. Thank you for listening to me today. A um, couple questions. What is your official capacity with the uh, company? I'm the Director of Labor Relations. Director of Labor Relations, okay. How many employees are we talking about exactly? In the United States? Nope, in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, uh, roughly about 300. 300. And um, you, 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 when did you raise the minimum wage? At what date did you acknowledge the law? Uh, we've raised it effectively April 6th. However, we've of been- Of this year? Uh, April 6th of this year. We've been negotiating or uh, with the union since December of 17, uh, right after the hearing that took place here. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Is anyone else to? Yes. That's so correct. it's not. We haven't gotten to it. It's about the effective date is. Thank you for thank you for clarifying that, Councilman. Uh, you, no, we. Is it, oh, Councilman Down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. I, said, I want to try to understand the situation for a minute. It's LSG Sky Chefs, you're in the business of supplying airlines with meals. And do you supply airlines other than American Airlines at the airport? Do you supply all the airlines? Yes, we do. All airlines, not just well, American. Yeah, we have, uh, I believe, 13 different customers at the Philly airport. Right. And you have services all over the country. That's correct. And in other parts of the country, are any of those airports paying the wages that are being paid in Philadelphia? Uh, there are some that are similar, yes. Of, the, of a size of the city of Philadelphia, though? Uh, some are greater than the size of Philadelphia. Okay. And it's my understanding that you've been in negotiations and trying to work this out for a while. And do you think they're going to be able to get this resolved in the next week or two? Uh, we have, we've been talking with the union about raising wage rates since December of 17. Uh, at my last visit here, I uh, spoke to the council and said that we were contemplating raising the wages prior to then, uh, but uh, our contract, our CBA, with the union gives them the right to ask for increased wages uh, every 12 months, and we had not heard from them. Let me ask you another question then. Based on the fact the wages are now $8.10, which is crazy low, but um, have you, are you aware of the earned income tax credit? Am I, the earned income tax credit, the federal program? Yes. And have we made sure that even if they're making 12 or 15 or 18 or whatever the number is, dollars per hour, and they have children that they will qualify for federal dollars. I just want to make sure if, if they're not getting the minimums that we want them to get, at least they should get the money from the federal government. Because last year in Philadelphia, we still left $100 million that could go to 40,000 families who qualify. Mm -hmm. And these are people that are earning the minimum wage up to $22 to $23 an hour. 
and have one, two, or three kids, they can get checks from the federal government and file back three additional years. This is free money. So at a minimum, what I'd like to see is Sky Chefs promote this in their paychecks and, and get the word out. So at least the money from Washington comes back to Philadelphia. I clearly understand. And I've been personally approached by employees who are positively affected by us increasing wages, but negatively affected by what they would see as benefits if we didn't. So I, I clearly understand what you're talking about. Sir. I have actually, ironically, a packet of flyers for the earned income tax credit, <laughs> and I'm going to give it to you, and I'd like to make sure all the people get it, okay? I will make sure they're distributed, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. God loves consistency. Um, uh, Councilwoman uh, Parker. Uh, if you don't mind, just one second. Go ahead. Mr. Chair. If you mind. Uh, I, I just wanted to go on the record and just clarify um, at least some of the information that I had, and if it's not correct, then I'll let um, the organizer come and correct the record. But um, since December, right, there hasn't been any, been any real going negotiations with um, Inai here. Is that correct or not correct? That is incorrect. That uh, is incorrect. That is incorrect. There are two levels that negotiations happen or can happen. Uh, I negotiate with the Unite Here International Union, and we've been talking about Philadelphia long before December. However, I'm not going to say the statement that was made earlier is incorrect, because the first conversation that I had uh, with the local was here in this courtroom saying, why haven't you asked for a wage increase? Here's the process. So if the city of Philadelphia passed a bill, right, that says here's a new 21st century wage across the board, let's even take the union out, out, out of the picture, mm -hmm. right? How come the, your company just didn't file the law just mm -hmm. for the simple fact of following the law and just mm -hmm. saying, you know what? Okay, the city of Philadelphia passed the bill, 21st century wages, now it's $12.20 an hour. We're gonna file the law to help our workers rise up out of poverty, be more competitive mm -hmm. as relates to operating our business at the Philadelphia International mm -hmm. Airport. If I may answer this, and I don't wanna go around the block with it. The 21st century minimum wage ordinance has been in several phases. There was a phase where it only affected people in the city and didn't affect the airport, I believe. And then uh, I believe in 2015, it was rolled into one ordinance. So there was a time when, it, when we weren't affected by it. And, and then uh, uh, shortly after the change in the ordinance, uh, we applied for a waiver and uh, at this point in time. A waiver to not pay the wages, correct? Correct. To not pay the wages. For wages and benefits, correct. Okay, all right. So, and one last thing, and this is the only reason why I get frustrated sometimes We're working with some of the major corporations who I welcome to do business here in the city of Philadelphia. I want to be clear on that because y'all do provide jobs, but the jobs mean nothing that they aren't good paying jobs. I just want to say that for the record. How long have you known that this particular bill, this bill, that we're discussing today. How long have you known about this bill? I'm not sure date wise or, you know, I do know that it's been at least a year, maybe more. Okay, so you know about this particular bill that's gonna be proposed for- Oh, I'm sorry, this bill that's being this proposed- This bill, this bill right I'm here. I'm sorry, this bill, I only learned about it last week. Oh, last week? Yes. Okay. So you, you learned about this bill last week. However, this bill has been on the floor in terms of me advocating for it, right, and working with you night here for several months. And no one at Sky Chefs thought it was right to say, listen, let me reach out to the council person besides today to express your issues of concern regarding this issue. We're not even talking about American Airlines. Let's take them out the picture. We're talking about you negotiating when you're not here, knowing that this bill is on the floor. You didn't know anything about this? 
I absolutely did not know anything about mm. this bill mm. until okay. late last that's, week or the week before. That's, I'm that's, sorry. That's yep. the problem with your company. Then. Okay, I'll defer to my colleague. Councilwoman Parker, and then Councilwoman Byrne. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and special thank you to the sponsor, um, District Councilman uh, Johnson, um, whose district includes the airport. Thank you, Councilman Johnson, for your leadership. I was just asking Councilman, Mr. Chairman Jones, uh, for some clarity regarding this uh, issue because I am a freshman member uh, here in, in council, so I'm just trying to sort of catch up here. Um, I just wanted to make sure that um, I heard you correctly in your testimony uh, where you noted that if, 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 this, uh, if this legislation was enacted, you talked about it having, and just please correct me if I'm wrong, it could have a negative impact or negative unintended consequences relative to recruitment and retention. Did you say that that could be impacted? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, now, now, with that being said, and I just want, again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, tell me, is it true that with LSG Sky Chefs, that in 2016, you had a, a turnover at the kitchen that was over 80%. That is not correct. Okay, um, what I will um, uh, ask you to do, just for the sake of the record, if you have um, that number that you could forward to Chairman uh, Jones, along with the uh, sponsor of the legislation, uh, Councilman Johnson, because when I heard you mention that Council's legislative action here could potentially have a negative unintended consequence of uh, negatively impact impacting your recruitment and your retention efforts there. But then I looked at data ju that just said, wait, your turnover rate in 2016 was over 80%. That would seem to me that the lack of stability relative to your workforce had less to do with the action that council would take make here today and much more about the decisions that the firm in and of it itself um, uh, would make. And so I know uh, mm -hmm. Councilman uh, Johnson and Chairman, Chairman Jones, if we could get that, I think that would be um, very helpful. Um, in addition to that, I want to follow up on what uh, Councilman Dom asked relative to wage policies at other airports. Now, help me, um, has Sky Chefs given raises in accordance to the wage policies at other airports like San Francisco, Los Angeles, and what about Washington Reagan uh, National? Have you done that? And what, are the, what do those numbers look like? There's, there are a lot of questions in there, so let me see if I can uh, recall each one of them. Uh, in the city of San Francisco, there is a minimum uh, a Quality Standards Act, QSP, it's called, and uh, it, it provides for wages, benefits, and some reporting activity. We pay the minimum, we pay at least the minimum that meets the requirement of the Quality Standards Act. We have a waiver. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for, for injecting here. I just want you to help me because we're here and, and I don't know the numbers. Mm -hmm. So if, so, um, if you've given ra raises in accordance with the wage policies at other airports, I guess for me, I want to be able to get on the record what that number is in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, and I believe most recently at Washington Reagan National, if, if there are numbers so I can correlate a number with the locale, if you would have that handy. I, I don't have that handy, uh, not here in front of me. Uh, so you excuse me, I don't mean to interject. You're saying you don't know what the wage, wage rate is in L.A. Uh, for your company? I, I, I do know that uh, effective March 20th was 12.08. And we are about, paying 12.08. And what about the other cities where they It was Washington, Washington. Washington. Yeah. What is that? 
I, I don't want to misspeak. Can you call somebody or those are, those are, because we can get an intern to Google it, but I mean, yeah, yeah. can you find that I, out? I, oh, I, I have the information just not here with me at this table, okay? Uh, the, again, I don't want to misspeak. I have 40 different locations throughout the United States. We just States. want to know about three. All right, I'm, a, I'm sorry. Okay. So, I, I, I believe Washington, Reagan, uh, MWA is at, no, I, I better, I, I'm not sure. Rough guess. Yeah, roughly it's either 1150 or $12. We pay that. Okay. Washington, Reagan, and uh, Washington dollars, they're part of MWA, uh, the Washington Regional Okay. Uh, Metropolitan Airport Authority. I appreciate you uh, putting on the record for us. Even if you just noticed you were giving us a ballpark figure relative to Washington, I, I know you'll get the actual number to Chairman Jones and the sponsor um, of the legislation. I guess it was important to me that you get that information on the record for the benefit of the public here and our residents in the city so that they will understand that the legislation um, that this city council passed uh, relative to the living uh, wage um, was not in any way, uh, shape, or form out of the context regarding a national uh, discussion and the impact that a living wage has on the quality of life for residents uh, in, in the city of Philadelphia. And uh, that is important to me uh, because Councilman uh, Jones and uh, Johnson, uh, we know that the majority of the workers here live in Philadelphia and they live in 29 different zip codes. Now, Councilman Johnson, you know, we know that it was 19142. You know 19142 yeah. well, right? But it is not 19142 alone. These employees live in neighborhoods across the city of Philadelphia that are uh, impacted by this. And um, it, is, it is with that in mind uh, that I don't want anyone in the, in the public who is just turning this on to think that this city council uh, of Philadelphia is attempting to enact any legislation um, that seeks to hamper the ability of business to be competitive in this uh, market relative to this industry. Um, and, and that is important in the context of economic discussions that we're having yes. in the city about how to grow the pie mm -hmm. and uh, you know increase revenues and bring new businesses uh, here. So um, I'll be looking forward uh, to getting that data um, be, to see how Philadelphia is faring with the other uh, cities that have engaged in this, this kind of agreement so that we can get that um, on the record. Councilman uh, uh, Johnson, I want to thank you so very much uh, for your leadership. Councilwoman Reynolds Brown, thank you, Councilwoman. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the point I want to make is the last remark that Councilwoman Parker just shared. It, it matters to us to see how Philadelphia ranks, to see how Philadelphia, where Philadelphia stands with regards to cities that mirror uh, us in population and or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So that information really gives us a picture of, um, of, of where we are and underscores why there's an interest to, to move us to a better place mm -hmm. on this particular issue. Are you at liberty to share with us, because I know that there are negotiations uh, underway, what the potential impediments uh, or impediments are towards reaching um, a better place with, with you and the sponsor of this bill? Are you at yes. liberty to say you may not? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm at liberty to say. Uh, I, I welcome your your interest in the statistics. One statistic that I just did on the train here from Washington to here was I looked at what we voluntarily implemented for the lowest wage rate, and I understand it's the same rate that you have for your bill, your 20th century bill. And out of the 38 locations that we have in the United States, Philadelphia will be number eight 
okay? So the first uh, of them are all West Coast cities. San Francisco, uh, San Jose, Santa Ana, and uh, San Diego maybe? San Diego. Then comes JFK, the New York, uh, and then it's Philadelphia, and it's followed by LA, et cetera. So your, your minimum standard is number eight in the hierarchy of the highest paid minimum standards that we have. There are roughly 30 that are below you in a minimum standards rate. I see. If that answers part of your analytical question. Yes. The second part of your question, and I'm losing myself. Uh, are, are you at liberty to share what the impediments might be? Yes, the, impediment to, common the impediment to getting a deal, as I was told by the union, is that they want in writing that in Philadelphia we will pledge either to CPIU or whatever the minimum standard would be in the future. That is the only impediment that we have, I believe we have at this point. Uh, we have, have put dollars on the table for the minimum wage to be at or above what you're asking now. And the only reason we don't have a deal at this point in time is that uh, I don't have the ability to uh, promise monies that the company hasn't authorized. I see. And my uh, final question. Future is, money, I'm sorry. In response to uh, Councilman Johnson's question, when you learned about this particular uh, legislative measure, what is the protocol or, or practice in your business when you learn and hear about legislation? Mm. Is there someone on the ground to be eyes and ears for you? Because uh, that helps us in understanding why it at least mm. appears mm. that yeah. this is somewhat I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because, as I said, we're in 38 different locations with 40 different units. And we normally, at the corporate level, uh, don't really hear about it until it's brought to our attention by the local people at the unit saying, hey, there's a possible hearing or there's a bill that's being put together. Uh, we, we do have uh, a source that monitors living wage ordinances and whatnot, but they come in so many forms that the words don't usually get through. 21st century would be something we wouldn't hear unless we heard the last part of it, minimum wage ordinance, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, QSP, the Quality Standards Act in, in San Francisco, California. There is no way I could put a Google alert or anything on that knowing that that's their minimum wage standard. I see. So they come in all different forms and, and the best information that we can get comes from our units. Comes, comes from, from? Comes from the local unit that's located in the city or the airport that's enacting uh, the legislation. Okay. Where are you headquartered? We're headquartered in, uh, right Atlanta. outside of Dallas, Texas. I see. Uh, okay. My last, my, my last uh, encouragement is to Councilman Alan Dahm, who's been exceedingly persistent and consistent in, in reminding us of the value of the uh, ETIC. And so you, your quote was that I, I understand its value. Are you persuaded to ensure that your membership, your, your staff, your organization gets the information and then urge to do the follow through? I am more than urged and more under an understanding, and I'm more than willing to make sure that happens. Terrific. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councilman. Councilman Dom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to follow with my colleague, that EITC, by the way, while we're all Philadelphians, is, is nationwide. Mm -hmm. So you can incorporate that nationwide. And by the way, just so you know the maximums, you can get up to over $6,000 a year and file back three additional years. Mm -hmm. So people working for Sky Chefs could get $24,000 from the federal government. They mm -hmm. just don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. I'm trying to break this down. Your new rate is going to be, is it twelve twenty an hour? Is that the? That is the lowest minimum wage we have. Okay. Lowest wage we have. So when you put that through, 
Do you then go back to the airlines and ask for an increase in your food costs to, to, to compensate for that? Uh, it wouldn't be in the food cost. Uh, most airlines that I deal with, or the, I'm sorry, that we deal with, I have a labor component and a food component. So it would be uh, something that we would try to recover from the airlines. Now, having 13 different airlines at a location makes it very hard. No knocks on American. They've been pretty good at if, in fact, it's legislative and if, in fact, and we, we have a brand new contract with them right now, uh, uh, we, you know, we will be having the discussion in regards to the additional cost. So I guess where I'm trying to go to, to cut to the chase, if, you, if you're going to pass through this increase in labor, I'm sure your company is not going to eat this increase. You're going to pass it through to the airlines, and then the airlines are going to pass it through to the consumers. So if I'm the average consumer going on a plane from Philadelphia to Atlanta, Georgia, what does that look like for me and my cost of my ticket? Uh, I, I, I don't know precise figures, but you're under the assumption, or I may have put you under the assumption, that all of our airline customers are going to pay that. I will tell you, when you have international airline clients, they're very unlikely to participate in something that they call your problem. So, uh, are we talking a dollar a ticket, two dollars a ticket? Are we talking more than that? Do you have any idea? I, I don't. Okay. Maybe the airline has more information. <coughs> Mr. Dom, I can't tell you categorically that those costs are going to be pa passed on or how much of those costs that we came prepared to talk about. What I can tell you is, as we've said in any number of times in, uh, uh, before this council, is the cost of flying is extraordinarily competitive. You know, we exist between Washington, D.C. and New York. We exist between Baltimore and Newark. So to the extent all we do is pass on increased costs, we're going to find ourselves in Philadelphia in an uncompetitive position. So that's a significant factor in, in uh, may not seem that way, but it's a significant factor in uh, uh, our, our pricing. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman and Councilman Tallenberger. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kessler, um, American Airlines, how many hubs do they have similar to Philadelphia in the United States? Uh, altogether, nine hubs. Nine hubs. And of those nine hubs, uh, is uh, Air Chefs used at all nine or? I'm not sure, but I don't believe so, um, Councilman. You, you believe? I don't believe so. You don't believe so. But so I, can, I can confirm that. I, I, I think that would be very helpful okay. in, in the decision-making process and what the competitive costs are at your other hubs and what, the, what, what is paid there as well. I think that's a, mm -hmm. very, very relevant, particularly okay. to this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman I, Johnson? I have a question. Just a question about Sky Chef. Um, how much revenue does Sky Chef make annually? Like, how, how, how big is the company? Uh, roughly about 1.3 billion in the U.S. Do you go beyond the U.S. as well? Excuse me. You go beyond the U.S. as well internationally? Uh, the, the Sky Chef brand exists in other places in the world. Uh, North America is uh, uh, a company within its own. It's called Sky Chefs Inc. And it operates uh, in the United States and its territories. But the one in, the, in America is, you said how much billion? I didn't hear uh, 1.3 billion, billion for the United States? Yes. Okay. Just want to get that for the record. Thank you very much. And that's an approximation, so don't let the CFO fire me for telling you. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, uh, it's a little harder living off of eight dollars an hour, though. Uh, you know, to pay the rent, Councilman Tolmerger. Uh, just to follow up on uh, Councilman Johnson's question about where else Sky Chef has operations, are there Euro European airports? Yes. How many? I don't have the number. 
my my functional area is North America. Okay, I understand. Because to be very direct about it, European wages are paid significantly higher than American wages. That's and that will be interesting on in what is done there. I think fairness has to be, that's why we're here. We'd like to have fairness. And at this moment, I, I really don't see that, but prove me that, 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 I, that it is fair. Thank you, Councilman. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, um, we will now, thank you for your testimony. We will now, re do we have others? Yes. Okay. Um, Ms. Williams, can you get us to the next panel? It said to Sese, Anna Constance, Miriam Magasa, and Abraham Jallo. You know how much room is on average here? Yeah. Yeah, let's close it. Thank you all for your patience and welcome. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. First, I'm Anna Constance. Pull it a little closer to you. Okay, no problem. Hey. My name is Anna Constance. I work at LG Sky Chef at the Philadelphia Airport. Um, I'm here today to testify, um, especially I was here before another board um, not too long ago about um, turnover, um, the pressure on workers to work hard. But I, I want to go on record as saying I've lived and traveled a lot, but I've never met a more dedicated and hardworking people than the people I've met, had the fortune at this time in my life's journey to meet at Sky Chefs. That no matter what weather conditions, they will show up for work and turn out the best quality uh, product for the service that is being rendered by the company. Um, we do have a high turnover rate. And I believe due to a sky chef not being competitive is like we're a training ground for the airport, American Airlines and other services at the airport because um, being that they're trained to run efficiently on airline schedule time, you are able to get jobs easier at the airport. Um, they don't have to train you much because you're already at the level of being able to operate at the pace you're supposed to operate at. So Sky Chef not being able to pay or unwilling to pay higher to be competitive with the airport creates a problem for us who love being at the company, love what we do, the service we do render. Um, so that loophole that is in the law, in fact, I first asked about the Railroad Act law and I did research about it because I kept hearing about it. What was um, that um, transportation workers somehow are not supposed to strike? And the question I asked the union was, well, what is the counter to that so that um, businesses won't always have the upper hand over workers where because they cannot strike, you are kept at a standstill? And they said, well, the city of Philadelphia has a law in place, but there is a loophole that can be closed to force companies such as Sky Chef to follow the law and not hold um, its employees at poverty level. Um, the, the kind man that was just up here stated at the last meeting that nobody is forcing the workers to stay at that company. I remember him clearly saying that. And um, the chairman of that committee asked him, told him, well, they need jobs, which instills dignity to individuals. Nobody's standing here asking for a handout. We are asking for livable wage to be able to reside in the area which is the Southwest Philly region, which because of its location with the airport and freeways that uh, move easily in that area, having easy access to getting out of Philadelphia and entering, cost of living has risen. Rent price, we're not able to pay that on what we're being paid. So most people with their children live in one rooms that they rent from um, somebody who has a house. And that is poverty. 
Looking at the city of Philadelphia and what it has to offer called the city of brotherly love, I don't think it's humane to sit and let a company that makes so much money deny its workers the ability to pay for a one-bedroom apartment or two to be able to meet some of the dreams of their children. I don't think that's being unfair to that company that it follows the law. There is a law and they are being, they feel that they don't have to obey that law. The reason we're here today, even with the $12.90, is to not have to go back to fighting again after the city has raised minimum wage again, to go back to fighting a three, four year battle to get them to catch up when the city has moved up again. That is why we're here today. Thank you. I will note for the record that uh, the company left and didn't listen to this. He's here. He's here. He's Where's he at? All right, I was getting ready to come at you. All right, thank you for being here because it's important to hear what they go through. And it's important if you value your labor, you at least want to hear. Even if you can't do everything, you can hear and understand their burden just to get to work. If you have to choose between car fare and eating lunch, or car fare and making sure your kids get to where they gotta go, that's a, those are tough business and worker decisions made every day. I'm sorry for interrupting. Would you please uh, state your name and begin your testimony, please. My name is Isatu Sisi. I am a utility worker at the LSG Sky Chef Philadelphia. I am another person who has been earning poverty wages for doing valuable work at Sky Chefs. Let me tell you, it has been very grim and discouraging to work at Sky Chefs for a long time now. If I and my coworkers had been granted the $12 minimum wage back in 2015, each of, of we would have earned something like 20,000 20, 20, more by now. That kind of income would have changed our lives. It would have allowed us to be less exhausted, to have better housing, to improve our lives in so many ways. Three years later, Sky Chef is finally raising our pay to the levels we should have reached years ago. We are pleased that Sky Chefs had finally implemented wages that look more like airport wages. But I have to tell you, there is something painful when we have had to wait more than three, more than three years to finally have the, ch the chance to be given the respect of another airport workers. I have suffered greatly because I have earned so little. My co-workers and I believe that Sky Chef is acting now because they know that we, the workers, are finally having a chance to share our stories before the elected leaders of this city. Now that we are speaking before you, we are afraid that if you do not act to help us secure our future now, when we are no longer in the spotlights. Our wages and our standard of living will get back stock again, and the, prog and the progress we have made will be lost over time. Please act on our behalf so we can know that we are treated as equals with everyone who makes the airport work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bring the mic a little closer, you'll be all right. My name is Maria Makasa. You got to bring it closer. Please yeah, speak up. Shukran. Yeah. My name is Maria Magasa. I am, job is to maintain the um, employment cafeteria at Sky Ship Philadelphia. We during my ship is I see 
my co-worker with this have a change to race. They work so much over time. They are very tired, all the time. We are tired of working so have they been poor. We ask you to stand up for us and all loud as to be try as may wish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the, your testimony. Any questions of this group? Well, thank you for testifying. Oh, Don? Councilman Don. Sorry. I looked that way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question for the three of you. Um, have it, either of you heard of the Earned Income Tax Credit, EITC? Have you heard of it? Have any of you applied for it if you, if you thought you were qualified? Not applied, no. Were you notified by the company about it? No. Mm -hmm. Do you know how it works? From what you explained. It's a federal program mm -hmm. that helps those earning uh, $8.10 to $23 an hour. If you have no children, the maximum check is like $508. But you can file back three additional years. So that's $2,000 you can get from the government just by filling out the forms, 2,000, if you have no children under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. If you have one, two, or three children under the age of 18, you can get checks up to $6,000. You may not have children in that category, but if you know people who do, mm -hmm. they can get checks up to 6,000 mm -hmm. and get up, up to three years filed back for 24,000. And let me just tell you the income, 44,000 single parent with two kids, 51,000 for a couple with two kids. I mean, the numbers are pretty high, and I'm only sharing it because this is free money from the federal government that is not coming to our people in Philadelphia. So if, if, you, if you qualify, fill it out. If you know people, tell them about it. We'll give you the forms. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilman, thank you. And I, I think maybe Denny O'Brien was singularly focused on one issue like you. Uh, but second to maybe Denny O'Brien. Um, thank you all for your testimony. Seeing no other uh, questions, we will <clears throat> now recess our public. I'm sorry. We have one more. Okay, I, I apologize. We're just trying to get. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your patience. State your name for the record. Good afternoon. Ibrahim Jalo. I'm here to, to tell you that on behalf of all my co-workers, we are tired of being second class citizens in the in the airport and the city we love so dearly. Philadelphia Alliance Industry could not function the kind of contact with we have the RLA contact. Make it very hard for us to make demands in all ways that most unions can. We absolutely need your help as elected labor, uh, labor leaders of our city to make sure that all workers in the city airport can, make, can move forward together and treated as equals. We should be granted a minimum standard that recognizes the importance of our work. Thank you very much. And thank you for your patience. Can I ask, what, 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 what exactly do you do at your job? I can't hear you. What do you do at your job? Um, for now, I build, um, I, I, I build sodas and juice for the sky chef for the airport. Okay. I'm a builder. Got it. Thank you so much for your testimony. Are there any other questions? Are there any other panelists? No. no Seeing none. Councilman. Just for the record, yeah. um, I want to ask for the bill to be passed out of committee with a favorable, favorable, favorable recommendation 
without suspending the rules so the two parties can continue engaging in their dialogue to come to some level of resolve. In the event that they don't, we will be voting on this officially on April the 19th. Thank you, Councilman. All right, we will now recess the public hearing to go into a public meeting to consider action to be taken on bill number 170956. The public meeting, um, I'm looking for a motion on bill number 17956 from Council Member Parker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I move that bill number 170956 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation. Second. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 170956 be reported from this committee uh, with a favorable recommendation. We are not asking for a rule suspension. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, the ayes have it. This concludes the business of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development for today. Thank you all very much for your patience. Councilman Dunn. Huh? I just have Oh, wait a minute. Ooh. Whoa, what? We have a resolution. We already did it. We did? I don't recall us voting that resolution. We don't have to. All right. So, once again, this concludes our hearing. Well, Councilman Dunn. I just have a comment for the, the gentleman from Sky Chefs. I need to do us a favor. It's clear to me that the EITC is not part of the whole program, okay? I need you to make a commitment to get the word out about the earned income tax credit to all of our people working at the airport, at Sky Chefs and the unions, all the, all the unions that are employed there, because we still have 40,000 people who are not getting this money from Washington. And you can see the three people here didn't even know about it. So whatever you can do to make sure that happens, we would appreciate it. But I need a commitment from you to make that happen. You have my commitment. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Councilman Don, for your persistence in this matter. Is money in, in the citizens' pockets? Thank you all.